Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles program, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that centers around what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program, which is called Every Little Thing. Being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, and many different Examiner columns. There's just too many of them. It's hard to keep track of all of them. Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Need a scorecard. (laughs) (laughs) Before we start, let's just uh, thank uh, Michael Lynch, who put together that really nice theme that we use at the beginning and end of every show. Thank you, Michael. Takes me back to 1962 or 63. Gives me that Mm -hmm. feeling. Mm-hmm. On our show this time out, uh, we're going to talk about the Fest for Beatle fans. This uh, past weekend, actually it was April 5th through the 7th, I attended the one at the Crown Plaza in Secaucus, New Jersey. And this is something that's been, you know, a ritual for so many Beatle fans through the years. In fact, next year, the Fest, formerly called Beatle Fest, uh, will be celebrating its 40th anniversary since it started. And the convention will be held at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in New York City, where it was first held 40 years ago, and it was called the Commodore Hotel. And that'll be on February 7th, 8th, and 9th, on the actual 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America. So, Steve, I thought we'd talk about what happened this past weekend and also uh, our own observances about the fest and why it's still important to us. Well, you, you, uh, you were there. Can. Mm-hmm. And um, so let me let me ask you, um, in terms of say last year, was it more crowded this year? It's tough to say. I know Saturday it was really packed. Um, yeah. I was told there was less of an attendance, but I'm not sure about that. So I don't want to give a report that I have nothing to verify for. But it was pretty busy. You know, Saturday is always the busiest day of the three, and I was there Saturday and Sunday. I didn't know I'd be there Saturday to the last minute, <laughs> ah. but. Uh, I really enjoyed myself, as I do every year, because um, I think the beauty of the fest is that there's so many different reasons to go there. It appeals to many different levels of Beatle fans. I remember when I first started going back in the 70s, it was a big deal for me to go to the flea market, and I would look for records and 45s and songs connected to the Beatles that I didn't have. Uh, or Beatle books. And now, these days, that matters very little to me. Really? I'm, I've never been really into uh, memorabilia or collectibles. And actually, where the music is concerned, I have, really, everything that I need. <laughs> right. So, I, I, once in a while, I'll see a book there that I don't have, and I'm curious about it, and I'll pick it up. But the flea market is not as important to me as it used to be. That, I mean, I have to admit, I used to hang around the flea market a lot, not for memorabilia because the prices were, you know, crazy. They were always pretty high. Um, but I used to look for I used to look for books and and bargains and things and you know see what I could find. And I occasionally found a couple of good things. I I mentioned to you recently that I found Johnny Gentle's autobiography uh, in there one time, um, which was interesting because I didn't know he had one, but he did. Yeah. And um, and it was. You know, it was a good price too, and I, you know, and that kind of thing. I'm always, I was always looking for that kind of stuff. Well, in the uh, beginning, because of uh, the book All Together Now mm-hmm. by Casman and Pedrazic, there was that section in there which I know I've told you about, but it concerns the Beatles' work for other people. So right. certain artists where George might have played guitar for somebody, and if I didn't have it, I'd try to hunt it down, or a song that they produced for another artist. That's the kind of place where I'd go to look for that kind of thing. And nowadays, well, you can find so much of that on the internet anyway. Right. So, and, um, of course, there's Christopher Englehart's uh, fantastic book, The Beatles um, Undercover, uh-huh. expanded on that. Right. And uh, and really um, just took that and, and blew it up and made that much uh, bigger. Um, I know that um, when I, I had at one point put together a collection of uh, George Harrison stuff, and that book was... was you know, was my uh, Bible for that. Uh huh. And, and you know, if you're putting together, if you're making your own CDs and you're looking for stuff like that, that book is really a, a godsend as far as that goes. Yeah, well, I'm fascinated by the side projects of the Beatles, and Chris mm-hmm. Englehart's book is just really essential. 
right. in that category. Right. In fact, because believe it or not, even though we're dealing with four of the most well-known people on the planet, something will slip by that got either very little or no publicity when it first right. came out. There could be some odd item of a song that Paul produced for an obscure artist, and you wouldn't even know about it because it wouldn't even be publicized. And right. somehow Chris was able to find that kind of thing for his right. book. He did incredible research for it, and he, <laughs> he has to keep updating it, too. I know. How are the prices in the flea market? Well, like I said, I didn't, I didn't really spend that much time in the flea market at all. When I was there, I was there mainly to go into the main ballroom because the biggest reason why I go to the fest now is to watch the interviews of the guest speakers and to watch the performances and also to talk to the fans and the people who listen to my show, I should say shows. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a great thrill for me to talk to them. Anytime somebody pulls me over and wants to talk to me, I'm thrilled. So I never say no to any of the fans. And you should be flattered, as I was, how many people came up to me and told me how much they listened to our show. Mm. So, you know, it's a nice feeling. And I also have a fan base in New Jersey because when I started, I did my Beatles show on a rock station in New Jersey, WDHA. I was there for 10 years. And a lot of people who still go on a regular basis to the fest remember that show which mm -hmm. ran from 1983 to 93. So I have a lot of core people from that time period. And then there are people who listen to my show now and also when I was on XM Radio. And uh, they're familiar with my history. And then from your publicizing uh, my show and our work together on things we said today, they gravitate over to that show. So it's a great feeling to know, you know, people are listening to so much of the work that I'm doing and what you're doing. How, uh, what kind of, what performances stood out for you at the, at the fest? Well, definitely uh, Billy J. Kramer. Billy has a new CD out called I Won the Fight, and he premiered a new song from it called To Liverpool with Love. He's got a few songs on the CD, which uh, I've listened to a few times, and uh, it's semi-autobiographical, the CD. There are lots of references to Liverpool and to Brian Epstein. And he premiered that song. He did Bad to Me. He sounded great. I thought he was in great voice. And um, Peter Noon sounded fantastic. I happen to have seen Peter probably more than just about anybody outside of the Beatles for the, for the sheer reason that he always tours. And he's in my area every single year. And he always sounds great. You know, he still sounds like he's 15 years old. His voice has held up tremendously well. He's a great showman. He knows how to put on a great show. He does his own shtick in between songs where he imitates Mick Jagger or Johnny Cash and that kind of thing. <laughs> Tom Jones. He's great at doing that. And he's very funny, very personable. And uh, his voice is in great shape. But as far as highlights, apart from doing Herman's Hermit's hits, and he did quite a number of them, he did more, he did more singing on stage than anybody else outside of the house band Liverpool. But he did A World Without Love, which surprised me. <laughs> I wow. wouldn't have expected him to do that. And he referred to it as a Beatles song. And he also did All My Lovin'. Now so, that I would have liked to have heard. Uh, his voice would have, is perfect for that. Yeah, and so. I've seen Peter so many times. And I can't recall hearing him do a Beatles song in concert. And you know he's a major fan. Right. So, well, I was going to say there's a... There's a for anyone, and I mean, it's pro I'm probably the last one to know about it, but just this year I discovered on Amazon a 1966, I believe, concert by Herman's Hermits on DVD. If you, if you, and I can't remember the name, I believe it was in Australia, and it's a, a Region Zero DVD, which means it can be played here, and it's a great, it's a great concert. Um, if you have Amazon streaming, it's uh, available free. Uh -huh. uh, to see, but it's a great, it's, it's, you know, Herman's Herman's at their prime. Right. Um, so yeah, if you like, um, that kind of stuff, um, it, it's worth checking out, but, but uh, yeah, I, I have to say, I've never, I've never seen Herman and I really, you know, I'm really kicking myself over that cause I would really like to see him, um, uh, once. Well, you know, I go to a lot of concerts, uh, my family, that's their main passion is music and we go to a lot of concerts and we see a lot of veteran acts and it's very important to us to show support for these people because you don't know how much longer they'll be around and you want right. to show support for them because 
it also makes them feel like there are people who still want to see them. So right. Peter is always playing every single year, and probably the reason why he still sounds so great is because he keeps his voice in great shape by constantly performing. Yeah, he doesn't he stay looks, away from it for too long, you know? He, he looks really, I mean, he's aged, if, if there's such a thing as aging well, he's done, he's done it. He looks, he looks, I mean, he's still, like you say, he's, he not only sounds 15, he, look, he almost looks it. He looks really good, uh, uh -huh. you know, considering how old he is. Right. Oh, um, I, I, I assume he must be, you know, in his mid-60s. Yeah. Well, he was the baby of all right. the British artists. I think when Herman's Hermits broke big here, he was about 15. Mm -hmm. So he always had that baby face. Right. And, um, you know, he's just, it's a great show. If no one, if there are people listening to this show who have never seen Peter Newton, you should see him because he really... He gives you a great show for at least an hour on stage, and mm -hmm. he'll make you laugh, and you'll be surprised at how well he still sings. And you know, and and the songs are performed really well by him and his band. And also another big highlight for me was seeing Tom Scott on stage, okay. and um, he did the with the band Liverpool, the house band. Um, they did listen to what the man said, mm -hmm. and he also did Oh My My. And uh, so all so these songs that he's known for having played for with the Beatles, and he talked a lot about working with George Harrison, and uh, the interviews also between Peter and Tom Scott were really good. The only the only um, guest that I unfortunately didn't have a chance to see because of the timing and all was Ken Scott, and I regret that. But um, Tom Scott was a great guest to have, and he had said something to the effect that, and this was really surprising to me. Uh, that the reason why he started to work with George had nothing to do with his background in rock and in jazz, but rather the fact that he developed an interest in Indian music, and especially in the tabla. And he learned from someone how to play the tabla, and that person was someone that George knew about, and he found out about Tom Scott that way. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, despite the fact that Tom Scott is one of those people, like so many studio musicians, who have loads of credits, and it seems like he's played with everybody, the main reason why George selected him had nothing to do with those people. It had to do with the fact that he loved Indian music and wanted to study the tabla. That's interesting. So, and Tom went on to, to uh, perform with, uh, with George on the 74 tour, and he's on several of George's albums. And uh, also on the Ringo album, and like I mentioned, listen to what the man said. And there, there was a very interesting story that Tom said that he just got a phone call out of the blue that Paul was wanted to know if he'd be interested in playing on a song for him, like he's going to say no. Right. But uh, Tom then said, when does Paul need me? And then there was a pause on the phone, and then he was asked, how about now? So he had to just <laughs> stop whatever he was doing, go down to the studio, and what you hear on Listen to What the Man Said was what Tom had heard for the first time. It wasn't even a first take <laughs> of a solo. It was what he was running through. He was just playing along to the song. Wow. And then he asked everybody else, okay, let's do a take. And they all said, no, that's it. That's the take. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing that a, that a solo that we've heard all these years that we cherish, and it's a big part of the sound of that song, was something that, you know, it's just something that he heard. He's learning the song, actually, as he's playing it. Right. So that's pretty remarkable. And he also yeah. said that when he went to the studio there, in the studio while they were working on this song, he noticed there was Mickey Dolenz, Davy Jones, and Tony Orlando there. <laughs> in pretty good company, I would say. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I hadn't heard that uh, that uh, Mickey and Davey were had any of those uh, things. That's uh, that's interesting. There's probably still a lot of things where the, where the monkeys are concerned that we don't know about, that's where true. they're connected with the Beatles. That's true. That's true. Getting back to the to the um, to the dealer's room, and this is probably a, an old question because of the fact that I mean. He, he doesn't allow them anymore, but did you see any bootlegs in the dealer's room? Uh, I don't know. I didn't look for them. I, I'm, I might have spent... I'm sorry. I mean, this is not where my interest lies these days. Okay. The only reason I go to the, to the flea market is to meet people that I know are there. Mm -hmm. Like David Bedford was there. He's the author of Liddy Pool. Jim Birkenstadt, who's the author of the new book on Jimmy Nickel that we just interviewed. I go to meet those people. I don't really go to hunt down anything. 
Well, let's yeah. talk, let's talk about the authors then. Um, you we interviewed Jim Birkenstad, uh huh, and you saw uh, uh, what did uh, what did David Bedford have to say? Well, he's there also to promote a new book that he's been working on called Fab One Hundred Four, which uh, he's hoping will be out in June. And there's a really good premise behind this book, and it's mainly about a hundred four people that have played a part in Beatle history, and many of them you either have never heard about before or have heard very little about who have played yeah. some kind of part in Beatle history, people that the Beatles grew up with as kids or maybe someone that might have taught George a few lessons on guitar or something. There are these interesting anecdotes. And then there are some obvious ones, like a Tony Sheridan, but there's uh, a lot of people that many of us have never heard about before. And so the purpose of this book is to focus on many of the people that had some kind of an effect on the Beatles and their history. And mm. uh, so I think that's a great idea. That is a great. Was the book out at the fest, or is it still? Uh, has it yet to come? No. It w well, there was like a sample book, but it hasn't oh, okay. been pressed yet. But okay. I got to see what it looks like, and it, it's very impressive. Okay. So I could tell David from just from the book Liddy Pool. He does a lot of research. He puts a lot of effort behind what he does, and a lot of care behind it. So I, it, it looks like it's a very promising book from him. Well, I mean, I was very impressed with Liddy Pool. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, a big fan of that book. And then uh, Jim had Chaz Newby there. That's right. Um, and uh, what happened What happened there? Well, Chaz actually got to perform on stage with Liverpool and play bass on a few songs. Oh, wow. Which was really nice. And he, from what I understand, he still keeps at playing the bass, and he still plays locally. You know, it's not a career for him. It's just a fun thing that he does on the side. Mm -hmm. But um, he was very nice as a guest and, and for an interview. Okay. You know, and um, he basically was saying that, you know, there were four dates that he played with the Beatles in December of 1960. And for those that don't know, this was at a time when Stu Sutcliffe decided to stay in Hamburg to be with Ashford Kirscher. Paul hadn't become the bass player yet, so they needed a bass player. And they had a couple of dates at the Casbah, and they had one very famous one at Litherland Town Hall. And he was asked a question about that because that's supposed to be this big pivotal moment when everybody noticed that the Beatles were a great live band. He didn't sense that that was this amazing moment in time. You know, for him, he, he got to be in the band mainly because he was a friend of Pete Best, but he knew a lot of the same songs that the Beatles were doing. There wasn't, I guess, that much of a reason to rehearse. A lot of it was just the same 50s rock that, that they loved, Carl Perkins and Chuck Berry and whatever. So he just thought that the, the crowd there was a bit more responsive to the music. But okay. it wasn't like this crazed atmosphere, like, you know, you sometimes led to believe that show was. So that's just his own observance, you know, of the whole thing. But just the fact that he, there's someone that's another part of, of Beatle history. There's a lot of people right. that played with the Beatles for a brief time or got up on stage with them, you know, for a few shows. And that's the kind of thing that David Bedford is just so good at, you know, doing some research on and, and finding more about that. Mm -hmm. And probably Mark yeah. Lewison will have something on these people, too, I would think. Yeah, But again, but, um, these were some of the highlights. And I also want to make sure that I say that on Sunday, the Newtopians performed. And uh -huh. they were one of the biggest highlights of the whole weekend. They blew everybody away. I was there in the audience, and I think the crowd was so into it because most of them had never even heard of them before. They didn't know what the concept was behind what they were doing. And we just had Rex Fowler on our show talking about the Newtopians and, and they do these really nice arrangements of John Lennon songs, Beatles and solo. And it's, uh, you know, a, a, a big band. I think it's a uh, eight piece, something like that. But, um, they have different vocalists. The arrangements are very different, more of an acoustic treatment and the crowd really loved it. And many times they got standing ovations. And wow. I could also, I could also see that when Rex gave, the website's address, which is thenewtopians.com, a lot of people were writing it down. <laughs> and uh, by the end of the weekend, Rex told me that they had sold out of the CDs. I mean, it was really an, an overwhelming reaction to their music. I think the crowd really dug it. And, uh, you know, that did my heart good because I, I, I really love their music, you know, the yeah. two CDs that they put out. Yeah, I mean, as we, as we mentioned last week, uh, they were, I mean, the, it's a great CD. It's a fantastic CD. Mm. Well, they have two CDs, and they're I'm both sorry, really CDs. good. Yeah, no, they are. They're fantastic. They're fantastic. They really are. Right. Um, so, 
Also, uh, the Battle of the Bands is always fun to watch. And there was a band that won that's called Rock Show. And this is a band that's based partly out of Brooklyn, New York, and partly out of Staten Island. And they did silly love songs to a T. And when they went back on stage, they did an encore, and it completely blew me away. They did Got to Get You Into My Life, but they did it the way Earth, Wind, and Fire did it. <laughs> these are really young people in their 20s and again it's probably like an eight piece unit they have a, a few horn players in there and they sounded just like earth wind and fire like their arrangement and i've always loved that cover of the song so that's a band that i would love to see if they did gigs in our area so that was another big highlight for me and also um i was a part of a couple of panels over okay. the weekend on sunday there was one that I moderated with Al Sussman and Tom Franjoan, who, who both write for Beatle Fan, and Tom works with Joe Johnson for Beatle Brunch, and does a lot of work for the fest. And uh, we talked about the Wings Over America box set coming out, and also it was a general discussion about our favorite McCartney tours through the years. And we got a great reaction from that. There were a lot of people in the audience that were very passionate about what they had to say about Paul, and you know what they'd like to hear him do live, and and making a comparison going back to the Wings Over America days, that that was a time when almost everything he did was a wing song or you know, post Beatles. Right. He only did five songs that were Beatles songs in that tour. And nowadays, it's very much very Beatle heavy. So right. the, uh, the crowd had their own input right there. So we made our own observances about McCartney's tours through the years and talked about what were our favorite tours. And that was a lot of fun. And then we, I also was involved with another panel with Al Sussman and also Bruce Spizer, who's written a lot of great books on the Beatles. And it was all about country music and the Beatles and how the Everly Brothers and Carl Perkins in particular were a major influence on the group. Uh, just out of curiosity, what uh, was your favorite McCartney tour? 76. 76? Yeah. Well, you know, when you study his entire catalog and you realize all the great stuff he's done on his own, I want to hear more of that. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that I'm dismissing the Beatles, obviously. That, that catalog is the greatest group catalog of all time. Right. And, you know, I, am, I love the fact that he embraces the Beatles with his solo music. I just think that there are a few select songs from the 70s that Paul does every time, like Band on the Run and Live and Let Die and Jet, sometimes, maybe I'm amazed. And then he'll do his new music, and there's very little in between. So, and he'll play stuff from his new album and rarely ever repeat those songs on the next tours. Yeah. So, you know, it's very Beatle heavy. And believe me, when he does Beatles stuff, especially Beatles songs that he's never done live before or hasn't done since the Beatle days, like when he brought back Day Tripper, I'm very excited about that. I love when he does Beatles stuff that he's never done live before. They're, right. they're definite highlights. Oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, da. Took forever for him to do that live. That's a song right. he should do live. But right. um, there's so much that he's done on his solo career that he's dismissed, or you know, I just wish that he would show more pride in that. And it's very <laughs> difficult to have a you know a proper balance of it all, especially right. when you're doing shows in stadiums and you've got fifty thousand people there, and many of them don't really know a lot of the solo music. Right, because I was I was going to say uh, you know the first time I saw him was 1990, and. Um, and I really wish he would actually do some more of that stuff. I mean, there were some good songs on that tour that he hasn't brought back. And, uh, you know, so... You mean the solo he, stuff from Flowers yeah. in the Dirt in particular? <laughs> yeah, flowers, the Flowers in the Dirt years. Um, not that I want to hear P.S. Uh, uh, P.S. Love Me Do again. <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, there's, a, you know, uh, there's some good stuff from around then that I wish he would, that I wish he would uh, bring back. And maybe he will as, you know, as time goes on. Right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, a song like My Brave Face is a great song. Right. A song like this one, to me, is a great song. We Got mm -hmm. Married, I think, really worked well as a, as a, as a live song. Since right. that tour, he's never done those songs. Right. He does the off-the-ground material in, in the um, 93 tour. He hasn't done those songs since. Actually, he brought back Hope of Deliverance a few times recently. But right. for the most part, after a new album, he doesn't go back to those songs. And Off so, the Ground is another song that... It's, it's such a great song, and it'd be nice to hear him do that again. But I love the fact that the crowd there was really into that discussion, and they added their own input, you know. And uh, 
certain songs that they wanted to hear Paul do mm-hmm. that either he's never done before or he hasn't done, especially since we talked about Wings Over America. There's so many songs from that tour, like Silly Love Songs, for example, that he's never done since. So, you know, that's it was a very interesting conversation, and it was great to see the crowd really get into that. Oh, and I suspect we will see some wing songs on the Out There Tour. I would be very shocked if we did not see some new ones. Well, one of the things that I failed to mention at this particular uh, panel discussion is, and it is a disappointment to me, is that as these remasters come out, Paul is not necessarily addressing them in his tours. When Ram came out, I know he did Ram On Mm -hmm. around the time at some of his shows, and he was doing it before the Ram remaster came out, and he did too many people back in 2005, but, you know, he could have done a few songs from Ram as the remaster came out. He could have done something from McCartney or McCartney 2 when those remasters came out. Right. It doesn't mean that as Wings Over America gets remastered and it comes out the end of May, that on this tour there's going to be a lot of songs from the Wings Over America tour. It doesn't mean that. You just don't know with him. It would right. be nice, you know, but yeah, we'll have it, to I see. Mean, it, it, it would be for him to, to do that. He, he hasn't he hasn't done a lot of that, and it's it's kind of weird that uh, he ha- he has refused to he, he hasn't picked up on it. I mean, there was a I wrote a long time ago uh, suggestion, and somebody actually I think he actually addressed it as to whether he would do a full album on a show. Right. And he and he said no, and that's too bad because I think that would be a great that would be a great show to pick it to you know pick it out. Maybe it's just too hard to to put something like that together and do one album or maybe he would want to do a bunch of different albums every night and he'd probably go through all that work. Yeah, but well I think that he feels that it's boring because it's predictable. You know what the next song's going to be. Right. Whereas when you do one of his you know, typical concerts, you never know what the next song's going to be. But nostalgia, I mean the nostalgia thing would would really I think would really push that boredom thing out of the way. I I think people would love to hear a full album of, of his stuff. Uh, yeah, and then you've got, you've got the problem, especially with Wings material, who's going to do the Denny Lane songs? If there's songs that, where there were duets, you know, right. like from Tug of War, for example, or, or the Michael Jackson stuff, like Say, 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 who would do that? There's an easy answer to that. Get Denny on the tour. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, actually, the, the, the more difficult thing is not having Linda there. Right. And, and you know, th- that for all we know, might figure into it, too. Um, right. But I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to get over dramatic as far as that goes, but we don't know, you know, what, what is figuring into that. But. And I can tell you that last year they did a survey amongst Beatle fans at the fest of songs they'd like to see Paul do that either he's never done live or hasn't done for a long time, and the number one song was Listen to What the Man Said which he hasn't done since the Wings Over America tour. That's another one. It's like a number one song. How can you not do it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> not to mention the fact there's a lot of big hits that Paul's had in his career that he's never done live, believe it or right. not. Right. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he'll surprise us this year. Anyway, so that wraps up our discussion on the Fest for Beatle fans. If you want to get in touch with us, you can write to us at our email address, which is thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch with Steve Marinucci, you can do so by what, Steve? Uh, writing to me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. And you can also email me at my own address, which is everylittlething at att.net. And you, you can also check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Lots of interviews on the homepage there with people connected to the Beatles. And there's Beatles trivia and prizes given away every single week. So, thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels. For things we said today, saying, I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today, saying, see you next time.